Uh, yeah. So I actually, um, for me, this is going to be a very useful um, exercise since I am shallowly knowledgeable of maybe some of the CES relevant proposals. Um, so Alex, when you provided this, uh, it, are these all of the pending proposals to CC39 at any stage? No, or, no. Uh, um, what they are are a list of proposals that I went through, I went through the list of TC39 proposals in all stages, um, primarily trying to match names of various sponsors to our group here. And that I was see. my only criteria was, okay, is, is somebody that I recognize on that list? Okay, so this is a good place to start. Um, and if I'm missing one that you guys want to um, champion here, by all means, add it. Cool. Um, I think maybe a good way to start this exercise would be to ask somebody more familiar to um, uh, to go through this list. Um, okay. All give of the these, one -liner and why it might be relevant to Cess. Okay. All are these were these gathered from the proposals, the the overall proposals. Or were these gathered, gathered from the agenda? These were gathered from the TC39 slash proposals page. Okay. We only want to, to cover those that are on the TC39 agenda. Uh, anything that's not being brought up at this meeting, we don't need to talk about. Uh, I had I think, hoped that we could talk about I think about there's two different exercises that are being conflated here. Okay. I was thinking we were talking about these in preparation for this TC39 meeting. That was not my intention, sir. I see. I see. I did not understand that. Okay. Okay. We can talk about these. That said, there's no, the only ordering that I put there was stage three first, stage two next, stage one. If there's one that's coming up for the next meeting, but, and you want to do that one first, by all means, there's no ordering to this. Yeah. Yeah. Prior um, Prioritizing things that are on the agenda for the next meeting seems like a sensible. Okay. And, right. and among them, prioritizing the things at later stages also does make sense because they're the ones that are, that we're in more danger of uh, if there's something that needs to be fixed. Um, okay. So. Have we actually started recording? Yes. Yes. All right. Well, let's um, mark. Do you know where to look to find out what's on the agenda for the next meeting and so we can prioritize accordingly? Yes, um, I'm trying to get there right now. Hold Brilliant. On. I have I have that page open. I have that page open. I can just grab it. Okay. We can post it. Okay. Um, and uh, yeah, you're going to put it in the link in chat? Leo built beat me to it. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Leo. Okay. Um, okay, so I'll, I'm just going to, re, uh, starting at section 12, I'm going to read the names and um, uh, for, mo for many of these, I think I'll, I'll claim that they're not relevant. And if anybody else has information, stop me. Um, uh, so string.prototype.replaceall, I believe, is not relevant. Um, named evaluation, I actually don't know what that is, but it certainly sounds, I can't not know what it is if it's stage three. Um, somebody know what that is? It's the... Uh name inference for functions. Oh, oh okay. Um, uh, okay. I don't think there's anything scary there. Um, uh, promise dot any and aggregate error um, is uh, there's this, this was driven by the attempt to be um, sort of complete around the duels of various things. So um, uh,
promise.all uh, uh, succeeds if any of the components um, uh, fulfill. I mean, promise.all fulfills if any of the components fulfill or it rejects if any of the components rejects. So the dual is one that um, uh, rejects if any of the components rejects. I'm sorry, reject the other way around. Rejects if all of the components rejects and accepts if any of the components accept. And um, I, I don't find this a tremendously well motivated uh, operation, um, but uh, you know it's there for symmetry and um, uh, but the new issue that it raises is in the case where everything rejects, what do you report? In the case of promise dot all, when everything accepts, I'm sorry, when everything fulfills, uh, the thing you report is an array of the fulfillments. Um, in the case where everything rejects, you still have to report a rejection. A rejection is a single error, uh, but you've got multiple errors to report. So this aggregate error was this new concept that's introduced to um, jointly report all the component errors as components of the aggregate error. Uh, and that led to a very long discussion about whether that uh, new aggregation is in a own property or an internal, a new internal slot. Uh, I objected on security grounds uh, to a new exotic internal slot that carries an object reference. All the existing 262 exotic internal slots carry only data, uh, like date, uh, and therefore their confidentiality holes, uh, but they're not, uh, they, they're not capability leaks. Um, uh, so that was successful. Uh, it is now going forward, uh, proposing that that's an own property. Uh, I think that's all there is to say about that. I actually have a follow-up question on that. Um, it's true that there are no object bearing internal slots that I could find in 262, but there's at least one in 402 and maybe more. I'm not, I'm not done looking. How do we no. feel about that? Tell me what's the one in 402? I, the, the, uh, I find it very scary. But yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> um, so I, I'm, I'm partway through, uh, uh, through the search. The one that I found so far is the, compare method of uh, intel.collator instances. Um, it's, it manifests as a getter on the prototype. And when upon first invocation, uh, it creates a bound function and puts it in a slot. And then and every subsequent inv invocation returns that bound function. It's truly bizarre from my perspective, but um, but is published. Uh, can you um, uh, uh, send a link to that? Just send it to the SES strategy mailing list. A link to the to the to, um, to the problem to the definition to, of to the definition. Yeah. Slot. Okay. Yeah. Uh, for the record, what was what was the name of this? feature it was the compare of the collators right so when, when you create a collator instance and then you try to access the compare method of it that runs a getter which which will return you a function bound to the receiver and it stores that and it will return the same one on subsequent calls, uh, which it accomplishes by storing it in an internal slot. Does that mean if I, 
if I wrap the collator and do the getter with a different receiver, it could store a different receiver than the collator itself. It might. Because that sounds it, like a bug. I uh, yeah, actually. So let me let me put the link in the in the chat here as well. Um, Let's see. No, so um, it captures captures the receiver, binds a function to it, and then stores it as a slot on the receiver. Yeah, but it only does a require internal slot on it, so you could mask it with a different collator, and bind it to a different collator. Right, but if you did so, then it would set this like. It's it's not going to cross the wires. Oh yeah, because it it's on collator. It's not on. Right. Okay. Uh, but it is an instance, and I and I confirmed that the um, that the implementations conform to it. Okay. So so you could yeah you could obviously use this as a communications channel uh, if you had Intel on both sides. Okay, so we definitely need to worry about this. Um, okay, all right. So that's that's the relevant information that um, that I wanted from it is basically like yes, four hundred two is in play. Yes, it's a concern there as well, um, and uh, and that actually affects one of the changes that I'm making now to a current proposal um, for segmentation. You know do you know if there's a reason why they save it? Uh, presumably, so that the um, so that it compares equal on subsequent gets. So if you do yes, like collator dot compare equals 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 collator dot compare, that you'll get a true result. I just don't know if that's useful in reality. Well, I, to be frank, what I think is not useful is having a getter at all. Like this should have been just an ordinary data property on the instances, in my opinion. Do you know, well, I guess we can figure out, maybe it would be better to go on the 402 call and ask. Uh, well, I do, I, I, think, I think probably yes. And it's something that I just found today. Um, but I was rereading the the thread from uh, the promise any discussion, and it seems like there is at least at least one person, probably more, on the TC thirty nine committee that that has this affinity for prototype hosted accessors, and and that to me feels like the real source of this kind of bug. Yeah, uh, Jordan Harband has a very, very strong affinity for that. Right. So, and that's the reason why I, why I brought it up today also. Yeah. You know, just, just wanting to, it, it, I, I think it is not harmless, is to summarize the position. But I yeah. think this might actually be changeable in reality. Yeah. Like, beyond the object descriptor is there anything that we would actually observe by change this access accessory in, in an actual function property um from from ecmascript code it would be observable i believe only off the descriptor so we, i like it is it is an observable change um but it, it's in a very minor space. Also, yeah. note that people actually using collator compare is not as high as it could be, unfortunately. True. But again, I suspect there are um, there are probably one or two other instances. I will send them all in a bulk email. Uh, any any others that come up are going to be similar to this. 
you know, or, that, that'll be an accessor on the prototype and um, and one way or another interacts with a slot on the instance. Are there any collator instances among the primordials? No. No. Okay. Um, and the uh, collator prototype is a, is a regular object that does not have the internal slot? Correct. Okay. Okay, so I'm, I'm good with that. So it sounds like a good find. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for finding that. Is this thing with the collator in the agenda for the meeting? No, uh, but no. what what I, so I, okay. I, missed, I missed the normal time window, um, but what is going to be on the agenda, what I am going to bring up uh, is uh, intel.segmenter where there is an instance that uh, should have a link back to the thing that created it. And I want to avoid this pattern. I want to use just regular data properties rather than prototype hosted accessors. Well, you have the plus one from the editor of ECMA 402. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll put that change in now. I'm, actually, I'm working on it simultaneous with this meeting. Okay, good. For the record, same for modifying this collator compare. Yeah, like there is my plus one. Should um, should I try to put that on the agenda? I as think a, so, as a distinct yes. topic. Yes. I think it we, fits into either a bug or editorial issue. But editorial, I would say, because we just don't have a clear guideline for proposals on this. Uh, what is oh sure, no, yeah, uh, like pr procedural aspects notwithstanding, is is this a discussion that we wish to have in the upcoming TC thirty nine meeting? I think it needs to be there just so we can document it and have it for future reference. Okay, I will do that as well. Good. So decorators. Uh, so uh, I don't know uh, what the status is now. Uh, whatever it is, so, I can guarantee you it's security significant. Um, they're still doing weekly calls. There's nothing really to report as they kind of are discussing use cases again. Um, they're trying to strip it down a lot. They got stripped down far enough at one point they were only going to talk about having three decorators and not custom decorators. Uh, the participants on the call have uh, been following, um, wanted to do more, but for now, there's just it's nothing to talk about. Okay. I find it intriguing. They they only said in five minutes for decorators. I think they're just going to say go to the phone call. Uh -huh. Okay, right. With a five minute time box, um, they're not expecting to get into anything controversial. Um, uh, so Yulia is going to be speaking about iteration helpers, which I know, I think I know what iteration helpers are, or at least used to be. Uh, but then in her title, she says, what to do about generator steps. So I don't yes. know what that is about. So iterator helpers were looking to reuse the generator infrastructure within ECMA 262. Um, the generator infrastructure in ECMA 262, however, has things like dot throw or dot return on generator results. Um, so this is just a discussion on what to do about it because for iterator helpers, some stuff doesn't make sense. Um, I see. Yeah, I think of generators are bidirectional. Iterators are unidirectional. Is that the issue? Uh, that is at least part of the issue. The other is abrupt return, like okay. using dot return or dot throw. It, um, some stuff just there is a lot of boilerplate to handle that bidirectional push into an iterator, and it may not make sense to reuse it. Okay. Okay. Um, May I ask if uh, I, I, I saw that observers are on the list of proposals that uh, that Alex brought up? Is 
uh, did observers emerge as the dual of iterator and that the generators are both? So uh, uh, ob observables were um, uh, uh, quite lively for a long time. Uh, and uh, then they languished. It was when I saw observables on the previous list that triggered, that was what triggered the question about, are these on the agenda? Uh, because if somebody had, was picking up observables and trying to advance them again, that would be very, very interesting. Um, uh, the observables were um, uh, were very well designed, very well thought out, uh, and most of the um, most of the, the wind behind observables was taken out by asynchronous iterators, uh, even though they're not quite the same thing. Uh, there just was no longer energy to try to advance observables once we had asynchronous iterators. Hmm. Okay, well, that answers the question. Well, I think another thing about observables is the, the main person who was the... the, the Jafar Hussein. Main, yeah, J Jafar um, has kind of dropped off of the TC39 radar. I'm not quite sure what the story is there, whether he was discouraged by not making progress or whether his work responsibilities took him elsewhere, or I, I don't know the story. But in any case, he was the main force behind that. And, and since he stopped participating, it stopped moving. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, uh, I, I, I felt some of that force. He called me on my phone once to talk about him. <laughs> But that was five years ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, right. that, yeah, what Chip said is exactly right. I think I'm actually listed as a co-champion on it and really helped Jafar a lot in the design. But once he's no longer there, there was you know, no picking up the momentum from him. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, I expect that to come back at some point, but good to have one thing to think about at a time. Okay. Uh, temporal update. Um, so the... Uh, the relevant issue here, the, the, I'm hoping that the only relevant issue here is the one that's sort of already been negotiated, which is that almost all of temporal, temporal is just computational. Uh, does not involve any I.O., does not involve knowledge of the, of the current time to avoid the date mistake. Um, but it's obviously still useful to have a privileged API uh, for finding out what the current date is. Uh, and it's useful uh, to have one, given the, the nature of temporal, it was apparently useful to have one other than date.now uh, so that it could compose more easily with the rest of temporal. So if I recall correctly, there's one property on to that temporal itself is a namespace object. There's one property of it that represents the privilege to know the current time and that all of the rest of it leads to things that are only purely computational. And, and that means that um, a CES still needs to tame it like it tames date, but it's a clean split that enables us to cleanly tame it and leave all of the computational parts implicitly shared by everyone in the realm. Uh, there, are, there are two others that I can think of. So there's the temporal.now, which exposes the local information, including what time is it. And there are date time and calendar lookups, which also reach out into the host although for information that changes far less frequently than the date and time. Um, what information does it reach out for? The, uh, it reaches, uh, the easier one to understand is uh, time zone, which reaches into the T local TZ database to, to determine whether, uh, whether, well, whether it is known at all, uh, and if so, what the particular transitions are of a time zone. Uh, and then similarly for calendar, what, uh, what calendar is the system aware of and you know, what awareness does it have of uh, the particular details of that calendar? 
Okay, it's so like Gr Gregorian versus Julian, that kind of calendar? Uh, yeah, so particularly we're looking at um, Hebrew and a few others that are escaping me at the moment. Okay. Julian is still used quite a bit. Yeah. Wow. So the um, so that's the thing to watch out for, especially when it comes to uh, deserializing strings, which runs the risk of privileged access to those lookups. Um, in the in the current representation, I believe there is no such privileged access. That um, that the spec, when uh, even when deserializing a string or doing arithmetic or anything, will will invoke the from method on the constructor of the calendar or the time zone or whatever. So uh, that makes it, I, I believe that makes it tameable. Certainly you can monkey patch the from method uh, and have those effects realized. So the, the, the question, the, 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 the taming issue is um, uh, not just whether we can replace it with something tame, uh, but whether the thing that needs to be tamed because it represents some kind of, of privilege or I.O. Is, um, uh, is well separated from the stuff that's shared. Uh, that what, I, what I mean by that is that, let's say you've got multiple compartments in a realm and you want to give each of the compartments, let's say, a different time zone as far as temporal is concerned, uh, but share all of the prototypes and methods that are all of the computational aspects of temporal, uh, you, you don't, you, that's what you would like to have is that the only things that have to be um, separated per compartment are these special privilege things and everything that's just about computing with those things is in shared objects. Right, so I believe, I believe that is achievable um, if you controlled client access to temporal.now, temporal.timezone.from, and temporal.calendar.from, that you oh. should not need to override anything else. Oh, okay. Um, temporal, okay. Uh, so the problem is if in order to have a temporal.timezone is time zone a constructor or is time zone a namespace? It is mostly a constructor, but from is a static method on it. Okay, so, so, that, so that's exactly the kind of problem I was worried about, which is in order to have different time zone froms in different compartments, you have to have different time zone constructor objects in different compartments. And that's exactly the separation we were trying to avoid. I mean, the, the, the intermingling we were trying to avoid. Mm. I, I, I want to be able to share the constructor if the constructor doesn't have privilege and have only the privilege be the things that have to be uh, separately populated on a per compartment basis. To have each compartment have to have its own time zone constructor when the time zone constructor mostly leads only to uh, powerless co computational things is weird. And it's especially weird because um, uh, there's, if everyone's sharing the same time zone prototype, that time zone prototype has a dot constructor property that points at some time zone constructor. Mm -hmm. That one has to be shared, and therefore that one can't have this from. Right. If you wanted to solve it in, in the current model, you'd have to get really fancy with proxies, I think. Uh, we're not going to do that. We're, 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 <laughs> okay. So it sounds I mean, like it's I worth mean, bringing I mean, that up. Um, right. I mean, there, there's a pattern that we're using that we use, for example, on the date constructor. So we understand the pattern to recover, but this is exactly what the purpose of the prior negotiation with the temporal advocates was about the security concerns is to make them separable. Okay. And I think at, that as it went forward, uh, uh, they must not have realized that uh, privileged access to current time zone, um, uh, it was among the, the issues to worry about. 
So from my understanding um, and, and having clarified the separation concerns, it seems like uh, this could be addressed by, by taking off the from static methods from the constructor and instead having siblings, which, you know, something like instead of temporal dot time zone dot from, it would be like temporal dot resolve time zone. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. That would be perfect. It is definitely worth bringing that up uh, in the meeting. And um, given the simplicity of the change, probably there's not a big issue with it either. Okay, good. Good. Okay. Um, uh, function implementation hi uh, hiding. Um, uh, I'm one of the reviewers on that. Uh, and that was uh, proposing two different knobs that were not orthogonal. And it was proposing the second knob called sense. The two knobs are called hide source and sensitive. And sensitive uh, was being proposed to address security concerns. Uh, and the security concerns that it's addressing are not, uh, I, you know, are, are genuine security concerns. They're not my security concerns. So uh, it was hard for me to reason about uh, the rationale for it. As I understand it, what they're now proposing um, uh, is only hide source. So. Uh, the difference is that hide source means that function dot prototype dot to string on a function whose source is hidden. Uh, the idea would be a hide source directive like a use script use strict directive that can be on a per function or per module basis. Uh, if the function's source is hidden, then a Function dot prototype dot to string on it uh, rent gives you the same kind of string that it gives for a native function, the built-in function, uh, which is a, a, a something that sort of looks like a function, uh, except that it has this funny syntax inside the body that does not parse. Um, uh, it's the square bracket native something. Um, uh, the uh, so that's all that's being proposed, and uh, I don't see any problem with that. So uh, I approved it on the review. Uh, the other part was hiding stack entries, and there were basically two approaches to it that were being discussed. There's the orthogonal form that Alan Wurfsbrock and I um, uh, prefer, which is there is a, there is a similar directive called hide stack, and if it's present, then stack frames of this function do not appear in the uh, error stack proposal that is yet to be you know yet to be um, uh, 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 moved. I think it's still in stage one. So so that proposal has been languishing, um, uh, but the idea is that. Whatever way there is of accessing stacks, those stack frames would be hidden. Um, uh, the other one was a sensitive directive. And the idea is sensitive would both hide stack and hide source. Uh, and the rationale there is uh, this function just wants to disappear with regard to reflective examination uh, because it's sensitive. And trying to pin down what the security concern is that sensitive addresses uh, is uh, not one that I've clearly understood. I'm not saying it's, it's not a good concern. I'm just saying that I didn't understand it. This feels like something that people are, uh, this feels like more of a developer experience related feature than a security feature. So I, I, I know that we were motivated to do something similar in queue to hide queue stack frames. Um, in long stack traces, but yeah. just, just to make them less confusing. Right, and likewise uh, with membranes, uh, Alex and I have talked about, and Alex talked to the committee about, it would be nice to be able to uh, have the uh, membrane part, membrane crossing part of computation to be able to have that disappear from stack frames. Uh, and neither of these uses 
uh, imply a desire to hide sources of those same functions. So that so the developer experience argues for the orthogonal hide source and hide stack. In any case, since only hide source is being proposed uh, in this proposal and any concern with stack is to be postponed to a later proposal, I think that's fine. And I think the concerns with the stack should in fact be merged into the error stack proposal, which, I'm, uh, which I do hope I, uh, to see advancement uh, as I proceed to shim it uh, as part of the session. Okay, um, realms, uh, I think we all know what's up, what's up there. Um, uh, number format, I have no idea. It's just a way of uh, joining numbers. Uh, there are different separators in different locales is really the key point. Uh, there's a few things about having long or short forms similar to how days of the week can be abbreviated. Um, there's nothing, I, I don't think there's anything we actually are concerned about. Okay. If, if there were anything, it would be, um, it would pertain similarly to temporal in order to find out what the, the host locale is, right? Um, yeah, I don't yes. think it defaults, does it? I think you always need to provide it something. It, it oh. has the same problem as, uh, as every other formatter in Intel. There's nothing specific to this one. Right, the, the Intel with regard, to time, with regard to time zone and such things, uh, Intel is hopeless. Uh, we've, we've kind of given up with regard to Intel, uh, but just hoping to avoid those mistakes with temporal. And the um, uh, 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 Intel itself is not on the CES whitelist uh, for that reason. It's unfortunate if we if we'd understood this going in, we could have we could have designed an Intel that could be on the, the CES whitelist, but it was just too helpless. Okay, uh, ergonomic brand checks uh, for private fields. I really like this. Uh, I don't think there's any security significance here. Basically, um, uh, if you do uh, foo dot in the in the private fields proposal, if you do uh, foo uh, dot sharp uh, bar to access the bar private field on foo and, and foo doesn't have a bar private field, it throws. Uh, so this one is basically saying that um, since you can already detect it to ask the question, um, uh, and since private fields are syntactically sort of kind of following some kind of analogy with properties, uh, provide a syntax involving in for being able to ask the Boolean question about whether this object has this private field, which enables you to just do an if rather than a try catch. So I think that's great. I don't think there's any security significance. Um, before we move on, I just want to, I just noticed something here. Um, I noticed the syntax here, um, hash brand, hash method, et cetera, is very similar to the syntax being proposed for records and tuples. Yes. So in records and tuples calls, uh, they've clarified their reasoning for wanting to reuse it. Um, they are trying to mark things which are syntactic features attempting to have some model of integrity with the hashes. They view private fields as having a model for integrity about them. Uh, they want to preserve that for records and tuples, particularly uh, for tuples, they want to have integrity around index access, numeric index access. And for records, they want it around string-based keys. Okay, I, I apologize. I, I just realized records start with uh, hash curly brace and tuples with um, hash square bracket, so there, there's no conflict there. I'm, I apologize. Right, no, no, it, it was still a good question because there's no syntactic conflict, but it's still occupying similar mind space. So the fact that there's one story that covers both 
was really important because otherwise it's just two unrelated uses of the same clip, which would be unpleasant. Not fatal, but unpleasant. Okay, um, so let's see. Okay, that was a uh, duration format. I assume that that is. Does that have any um, uh, any Intel issue that we didn't already? That's not like what we already talked about. It's more of the same. Okay, good. Uh, records and tuples. Um, uh, there's. Uh, there's a controversy that has really blown up on the issue thread. Uh, and it, will, it doesn't look like there's any signs that it will settle soon. Uh, so I'm sure it'll still be a live controversy at the meeting. Note that, by the way, that they're not proposing stage advancement, just an update. OK. Uh, nevertheless, uh, I'm sure we will take uh, as much time as uh, it takes to fill a time box with this controversy, because everybody's going to be impassioned about it including me. So we've had two phone calls for, I think, a total of two and a half hours over the last two weeks on it. Um, so far, the, the real crux of the matter comes down to uh, the ability to do a brand check on records. Um, I don't think tuples actually have much controversy on them. Um, oh, uh uh, sorry, I don't know what the brand check controversy is. I was talking about something. Ooh, okay. Um, so the oh origin of the controversy comes down to for a record, record.prototype needs to have a value. Should that value be an object, null, or something else? Um, so we can't use instance of for its instance of, it's not super reliable. Uh, to determine if something, a boxed form of a record is a record. Um, so if we box a record, um, there are various ways to do this. It's a primitive. You can do this with any other kind of primitive. Every single other kind of primitive has a way of detecting that it is a boxed primitive. Um, without the ability mm -hmm. to do a brand check on it, because let's say the box itself has a null prototype, um, you get into awkward situations that you don't know how to do. So one of the things on the calls was potentially introducing a record dot is static method um, to determine mm. if something is a boxed record. Wow. Wow, that's awful. Okay, uh, and um, wow. Uh, this is a much more substantial controversy than the one I've been obsessing on. Um, uh, the, the other controversy is uh, what the equality semantics are uh, on records and tuples. Um, uh, the problem is that the JavaScript has so many different, um, uh, even among the well-behaved equalities, i.e. everything other than double equals, uh, they take uh, different stances with regard to uh, minus zero and nan. So uh, the question is, uh, when you compare records and tuples, that somewhere deep within them might be a minus zero or a nan, uh, how should the record and tuples compare? Um, and uh, uh, this one's all over the place. I'd agree. That is probably the bigger controversy. The ability to detect if something is box tuple uh, is more something that we just need to be mindful of if we're caring about membranes. Um, I know Array was in a semi-similar semi situation, um, but I, I don't think this is new territory, at least for the brand check. Okay, definitely something for this group to pay attention to. Uh, do expressions, is this, there, there was a very old you, proposal. You, you didn't say what the other controversy was. Well, it was the, it was the equality. Um, it, was, it was a brand check and equality were the two controversies. Yeah, equality, uh, equality around minus zero and man. Oh, okay, never mind. Yeah, um, the, the, the problems with minus zero and man and the need to, 
to repeatedly uh, argue about them will survive humanity. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think as the joke the cockroach goes- cockroach of international standards. Right, yeah. yeah. The, in, in the end, it'll be Keith Richards and a cockroach arguing about it. You see my minus zero and Nan. Yeah, no, maybe it might go past the heat death of the universe. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, okay, so do expressions. Uh, there was an old do expression proposal that seemed clean except for one thing, which, I'm, which at the time uh, I didn't think to argue about, but if they're reviving it, I want to argue about it. Um, uh, the idea with do expressions is that uh, right now it's very awkward to, to say statementy things uh, like a switch statement in an expression context. Uh, the only way you can do that is uh, with an iffy, uh, with a immediately invoked function expression, which with arrow functions is much less unpleasant than it used to be, uh, but it's still quite unpleasant compared to um, if you just had this thing for um, writing statements in expression context. Uh, the problem that I'm now going to flag that I did not flag at the time was uh, if what's going on in a do expression is just a statement body is where all the code is, where does the value of the do expression come from? And the answer last time was use the completion value rules. And uh, the completion value rules right now are operational only for eval. And they, uh, they, and in my experience, uh, there's two uses of eval in practice. There's evaluating statements for effect, or there's evaluating one expression statement for value, where, where realistically you think of it as evaluating an expression. Um, the, the result is that people do not often encounter the bizarre rules for completion value. The rules are bizarre, they will surprise people, I do not want to put those rules in a place where a normal programmer will encounter them. Um, so um, that is still the case, but there is a different spin on it this time around. Um, okay. For a lot of the completion values, there is somewhat general agreement that there are a variety of ways you can produce a completion value, which is for the most part surprising. Um, but the syntax that produces surprising values is actually somewhat limited. And so the idea is you explicitly error if a if the last statement of a do expression is a essentially surprising syntax. So things like variable declaration, loops, and that would uh, be an error to have in the tail position of a do expression. That probably solves my problem. Obviously, we need to look at what the specific rules are, but but certainly something uh, I would so, something that followed those rules to the point that there was no longer a nasty surprise. I would find fine. Um, so this does have some precedent in other languages. Uh, which don't use the idea of completion values, but they use the idea of lack of terminator as lack of terminator sigil as a completion point within a source text body. Um, one thing that was surprising was there is a need to do a what looks like web compatible change to the spec. In 2015, there was a accidental change during a refactoring to the specification about completion values and the break keyword, uh, and also to if else expressions. Um, and that just needs to be cleared up uh, because right now that is surprising. And 
I think everybody who's seen the code is surprised by it. Okay, well, very good. I'm expecting that I will end up happy on that one. Um, module attributes, uh, we've talked about that in a previous one of these sessions. Uh, that's going to be a pain and annoyance, but only, I, think, I think only a pain and an annoyance. I don't think there's a fundamental problem here. They just yet more bookkeeping that has to be threaded through all of the module specifier handling logic. And it's not a place where it's pleasant to thread a whole bunch of new information through. Uh, Chris, is that about your assessment? Yeah, yeah, it, it's it's doable. It would complicate the compartments API. Um, it's a dubious. Lot. It's dubious, in my opinion, whether it's useful. Um, I think that the I think that the security concerns that were cited that motivated the change uh, motivated this proposal could be addressed other ways. Yeah, the, the, um, the idea that it's the consumer, the consuming code that gets to determine the type of the data being consumed seems exactly backward from the security point of view. Uh, no, it's an assertion check that they're asking for. It is not a uh, change of evaluation. I gotta raise a small point here that I just noticed. Um, I'm looking at uh, the module at attributes proposal under the import statement section. Um, they have the line import JSON from foo.json with type JSON. I'm worried about the possibility of some turkey putting in a semicolon before the with line, I'm before the keyword with. Because as you recall, with is actually has some meaning in non-strict JavaScript. Yeah, but there are there is no no such thing as non-strict module, right? So the the so with the import expression, uh, um, you, you might be right. I, I I think you're right. I'm sorry. Yeah. So um, and I think Alex, would you agree that? There is a width that appears in the import expression in this proposal, but it's not one that's subject to the confusion because that's just you know normal expression syntax. Right. I, I'm I go far, so far back that I still think in sloppy mode a lot of the time. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Bradley, what's your take on module attributes? Is this something that you'd like to see land in its current form, or make progress basically from its current form? I have no personal desire to ever use this thing, uh, but I don't see it harming me in any particularly strong fashion. So let me double check that I understood what you said about it being an assertion. Uh, it has no role in determining the interpretation of the content that was fetched. It just, okay. okay. That is a huge relief. It's a very different take than the one that we last conversed about, though, I think. That was uh, a very argumentative fight, but yes. Um, there are two oh. categories of module attributes being discussed. One are going to be temporarily called the evaluators, and one is the assertions. They are only interested in the assertions right now. So you what could, for example, value? have an integrity check that does a SHA uh, check against the body mm -hmm. or things like that. Okay. They are only proposing type and only type with a value of JSON to the spec. And that, that's the, pardon, that's the sole evaluator semantics? There are no evaluator semantics. Being prepared. Okay, so the, so saying type JSON is to say that uh, that the module loader, presumably the compartment, will need to be able to compare um, what the module advertises its type to be to the type that they intend it to be. Correct. So, this require, so in the web context, uh, this requires. Um, the provider of the content to 
uh, properly identify the content, presumably with a MIME header, or um, well, are, are we assuming that uh, JSON content content is served with the proper MIME headers? Yes, that is the assumption for the web context. I do not know if they intend to send an accept header, though. So the oh, I see. That's fascinating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, because you, yeah, okay. So it, what, what this implies for the compartment API, if it were to go forward, is that um, for the purposes of assertions, um, the import hook would need to see what those assertions are, and it would need to. It might not need to do anything special, um, actually. I, my, my initial thought was that the module static record might need to carry an arbitrary bag of things, but it sounds to me like the import hook would need to uh, to receive the, the the bag of asserted uh, things, and then it would be up to the import hook to implement the assertion uh, and map the type, for example, to the corresponding MIME type, possibly, possibly translate that to an accept header, and then possibly also verify that the that the response content type matches the assertion. Yes, the important part about the assertions are they are not part of any cache key algorithm. That is, evaluators yeah. are being punted on, they may be. Okay, um, that is not what I understood it to be. Um, and that is, that, is, that is less problematic than what I assume. I, I still kind of think that it's gross because I think people are going to leap to the same assumption I did. Um, and that this will lead to a proliferation of possibly compartment. That is implement. the majority of the issue tracker from non TC39 members. So I'm everybody, sorry. Is, everybody on the issue tracker who is casually glancing seems to assume it alters the uh, response interpretation. I would agree. Yeah. That is. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Common. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Okay, Bradley, next one's yours. Sure, so apparently uh, module records in the JavaScript spec don't actually have a limit on the exported names. They can be any string. Um, they can be invalid JavaScript strings, fun. Um, but WASM modules in particular and some of the things in WASM modules are exporting non-identifier name uh, bindings, which are visible in JavaScript. They are visible via export star from, or if you import a WASM module namespace object. So this is just saying basically we should have some syntax that we can do all the other operations that we can do with identifier names with arbitrary strings. Is this adding new syntax? Yes, unfortunately. Whereas right now you could import curly brace foo from bar, um, that foo must be an identifier name. Um, this is adding a syntax where you basically can put a string literal in the place of the identifier name being imported and uh, import under that. Um, this also uncovered okay. some- follow? Hmm? Does, it, does it follow the general um, rules elsewhere in the language for uh, uh, un quoted versus unquoted property names, like in object literals? I believe so, yes. Okay. I am not actually proposing the exact syntax. I'm I'm stage zero. But okay. that is my goal. Obviously, the, the the these these funny strings cannot also name variables. So you can't import uh, you know blah 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 uh, from, but you can import blah 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 as variable name from. Is that correct? Correct. And you can already in export in pure JavaScript non-identifiers. You can export as function, which is weird. Um, you can rename your identifiers to things that are invalid binding identifiers, such as the function okay. token. 
Okay. Well, currently, they, currently they, in uh, in JavaScript, the export names must match the identifier name production, right? Uh, identifier name, yes, not identifier. Yeah. So, like, right. So you can you can export non-identifier identifier names, but you can't export like punctuation. Uh, correct. Which is the same rules for object literals. Right, but is not is, that's not the rules for arbitrary modules just for the ECMAScript ones. Correct. Non-ECMAScript modules can have any string. Okay. Okay, well, good. Uh, next yeah. is Intel enumeration. Is that just another Intel? Same story? Oh, we're now at stage zeros. Um, uh, So I'm, I'm just reading the list to myself. I'll just read it out loud. Async context, deep path properties and record literals. Okay, that was actually interesting, but not security significant. Um, uh, Intel number format, um, uh, from dot, 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 import, Bradley? Uh, that's just a secondary grammar. So instead of import, being the first word from would be the first word in a import. This has to deal with a variety of basically user experience issues. It's no new semantics. Better completion in editors. I, I did not understand. What is the syntax being proposed? From foo import bar instead of yeah. import bar from foo. And the reason for this is better. Yeah. So it actually stabilizes the location of tokens. It gives you better editor yes. completion. It matches many more languages. Um, <laughs> but there, there are preliminary like shots fired, and that's probably never going to go through. Okay. Why didn't we do that in the first place? Uh, that is lost to time. I have found out. In okay. 2009, that was the ordering that was being looked at. And then uh, at some point around 2011, it started with import as the first keyword and it was never looked at again. Uh, we have some guesswork feedback of people participating at the time. It was to simplify the grammar, to not use a no line terminator here. Uh, 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 because from is not a keyword, got it. Okay. Oh, yeah, of course. All right. Okay. Um, yeah, I can see how that would have been how we got there. Okay. Uh, generic comparison? Uh, the spaceship operator in other uh, languages exists. It is oh. uh, essentially so it the TIE fighter. Uh, but uh, the proposal isn't to add the spaceship operator directly, although it's tied to it. It is to add a uh, method to um, arrays that serves the same purpose as the spaceship operator. What is the spaceship operator? I don't believe I've heard this term before. It is a three-way comparison operator. Um, Have you, you seen it's from read a blog Pearl. post. It is very hard to explain. I cannot do so. All right, I'm going to get it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that one. Yeah, it's it's literally the compare is the compare operator from Perl, um, which which it, it, as as a concept exists in JavaScript already, since that's the that's the it is the type it is the operator that corresponds to the 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 type of a compare function that you would pass to sort. Uh, I probably am going to be sorry to ask this, but what does it do on nands and minus zeros? <laughs> well, I believe the... it's always false because, yeah, um, no, for negative false, zero. False isn't even one of the outputs here. Um, oh, yes. Uh, so because nand compared to anything is false, um, it's always going to take a path in which, oh, that's interesting. We should ask that. <laughs> yeah, the, the funny thing about the spaceship operator is that for the type of numbers, it is equivalent to subtraction. 
Hmm. Okay, and we know what subtraction does with NANDs. Can the output of the spaceship operator be a NAND? Uh, it is always negative one, zero, or one. Okay, then I, yeah, I really don't understand what this thing does with NANDs. That is why I was suddenly confused. Okay. Dot item is just give a dot item method to erase. What is it? Uh, it's just an index lookup. It's for ease of transitioning between DOM APIs and real JavaScript. Okay. Uh, oh yeah, the, 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 this next one, subclassing support for built-in methods, uh, Delenda Est. Um, uh, that one is fascinating and I, I am very, very much in favor of it. Uh, uh, Delenda it, Est is yeah. some, yeah, uh, this is some ancient phrase uh, meaning must be destroyed. Carthago Delenda Est. Carthage must yeah. be destroyed. <laughs> oh, I yeah. thought it <laughs> yeah, there was, there was uh, I forget which it was, one of the famous Roman orators would always end every single speech with that. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, it, 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 that orator was, was Doug, except that it was IE must die. And the other thing which is mildly interesting is, is Yulia is the one using that, right? I, I think people I'm a little bit I'm, I'm, I'm sorry I'm a little bit confused by what they're asking for yeah Just let me get to rid of read. symbol dot species there's there's three levels of subclassing weirdness that the current spec uh, commits the language to uh, all three of which make the language incredibly harder to implement correctly and the history of bugs against V8 uh, also show that um, uh, being hard to implement correctly, often people don't. So they um, have so seven like, security bugs in the last two years, more from the presentation in 2018. Yeah, um, so, uh, and the, the weird subclassing semantics that's so hard to implement is also approximately useless, and more than that, is as far as we can tell, approximately unused. Um, so this is one of those rare things where even though it's been shipping compatibly on all of the engines for years now, conforming to the spec, uh, we actually think we can remove it without breaking anything, which would be a stop. So funny. I I remember Dominic fighting so hard for promise subclassability. Oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was that was one where um, Alan Wurfsbrock coming for you. Know, Alan Wurfsbrock and I both come from a small talk background, but he was very very much enamored of the uh, subclassing mechanics of being able to override. Uh, portions of operations and having operations delegate to self so that those portions could be overridden. Um, and, you know, it's an elegant theory. Um, uh, I was skeptical at the time, but uh, I wasn't skeptical enough. It turned out much, much worse than I expected. Um, uh, so in any case, one of the things is the species thing, so that if you have a foo array, that says that its species is, um, uh, you know, name some other constructor as its species, and then you do a map over the foo array, uh, that the result of the map will be an array that instantiates uh, uh, whatever the name species is. Um, and then there's things like in regex where the, the normal, normally named operations for portions of them delegate to symbol named operations so that subclasses of regex could override the symbol named operation uh, in order to change the normally named the behavior of the normally named operation on that subclass 
So you could change it in a more modular internal fat manner rather than changing the publicly named thing as a whole. Um, and that's about it that I remember. And I completely support uh, that we should you know, get rid of this stuff. So we have around 400,000 sites or domains that are using species in some way via feature tracking. All <laughs> sites we have crawled with a automated browser to get a real JavaScript evaluation. Exactly none of them do any usage of species except for feature detection to polyfill, which is astounding. Um, yeah. There yeah. are thousands of sites we've crawled and none of them hit it. Um, unfortunately, while we expected people to use it species for a specific way of subclassing, all of them implement subclassing in different ways. In particular, Angular uses at species, but it completely replaces all asynchronous uh, things within the context it lives in. And so it cannot use the built-in promises at species. It must recreate it in its own zone aware promise class. So mm -hmm. nobody is actually using it. The people using the uh, style of extending are doing it entirely on their own and they never call the built-ins. Yeah. So this, this not only is great in itself, in that we can be removing uh, uh, unneeded problematic crap from the spec, uh, is it sets a precedent that there might be other completely unused problematic crap that happened to be in the language uh, that we might be able to remove. I mean, it, it, it makes the possibility of that um, much more realistic. Uh, I highly suspect this will break someone when we do this, but. Yeah, and, 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 and then it becomes a case by case basis kind of thing. Uh, we've had some cases before in other transitions where the thing that broke, uh, we could just call somebody up and have them fix it and it was done. Uh, that's, that's, um, and then other things that broke were in libraries, in old versions of libraries. Uh, that had already been fixed in the present version, but the old version was distributed by copy, and those we just gave up on. There's no way to fix it, even though so it's not no longer the current ver version. We have identified some of those. Uh, there is a blog hosting platform that is 2% of all usage, uh, for example. Um, and so if we can get them to update a specific library, which is only using it for feature detection, they never actually use species, it would drop it from the usage counter. Uh, so uh, fixing a library does or does not have the effect you want, depending on how the library is distributed. Um, so the blog hosting platform is hosting the JavaScript file that we want changed. It's a Japanese okay. blog hosting platform. You cannot put arbitrary code in it. Okay, great. Uh, overall, this looks semi-reasonable. We have a scraper at GoDaddy, which I've been trying to get through fiddles uh, that we have uh, been trying to do this feature detection with higher uh, confidence. It is very unhappy uh, doing more than scraping network traffic, but uh, we might have that done after the meeting. I was hoping to have it done before the meeting, but for now we've just got you know, 3,000 sites crawled instead of that whole amount. So is the idea of this to alter the behavior in such a way that, for instance, the array prototype methods, when called on an arbitrary object uh, that derives from array, will return array instances rather than the subclass? Yes. Correct. Okay. So it's like, this is like full on, like as dramatic a change as could be uh, made in this space. 
Correct. And we have been okay. trying to find anybody who is actually using the behavior. So I definitely experimented with that for jQuery, but it never made it to a release that I can think of. So we have found people trying to use it, but in reality, they almost never use it correctly. And so it fails. So they will mm -hmm. replace at species with their own thing, which causes it to not use the default at species, <laughs> which returns this. Right. And so it breaks it for all subclasses of theirs. And so, uh, yeah. I wonder if we could actually remove the support for subclassing promises. Um, Man. I this don't was, think so with zones in Angular. This usage is just too high. Okay, right. If we can't. I I agree that we cannot break Angular. I um. I want to believe in this feature. <laughs> um, please try to find people who are actually using it. Um, considering. Oh no. no. <laughs> I, I'm sure that there won't be any, but this is definitely, if I, if, if I were 10 years, 15 years younger and new to the web, this is the first thing I would abuse. I'm pretty sure. I mean, now that eval and with have been thoroughly abused, this is what I would work on. Eh. So that's the interesting so I actually thing. Um, everybody who tries to abuse it accidentally destroys its behavior in a way that for the most part, this change is actually a no op so this all means that we're going to suddenly discover that it's necessary for implementing the test shim <laughs> <laughs> the test shim literally is firing mostly because it is replacing the default at species with the exact same source text and so it fires the trap because at species has been replaced on a built-in Mm -hmm. but it's been replaced with the exact same behavior. So which piece of code are you talking about? So the default at, at species of built-ins is a uh, getter that returns this. So it returns <laughs> this either. Um, everybody who is doing this to try to be sneaky replaces it with a hard-coded value and breaks subclassing. Um, everybody who is feature detecting is eagerly replacing that getter with their own getter that returns this. So it is the same behavior if you're doing feature detection or polyfilling, or it is just broken if you are trying to be smart about it, is all the cases we have found. I mean, is it possible to use this in an intelligent way? Yes, it is. Yes. But we yes. have not found anybody actually yeah. doing it. Yeah. yeah. This reminds me of something I tried to do in C++ when I was in junior college. I was trying to take the standard I.O. Uh, from the standard template library and uh, extend it such that you could put ANSI escape sequences uh, in line with, uh, with your stream. And the problem I ran into is that I needed to override the extract operator to accept additional flag types. Um, and because it wasn't polymorphic and because it, it was, it was all, you know, template generics. Um, if, uh, if I, if anywhere in the sequence of operations I did on the stream by extract, 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 um, I ended used, used something like endl. It would have been. It would return an, uh, the 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 original I/O stream type, and I wouldn't, from that point on, be able to do any of the fancy things that I had added to um, my subclass. Um, so, you know, wise people would just give up. But then I decided to write my own template library until I found out I just couldn't make that work. So um, this library used to properly use add at species. Um, but they remove the code. This is this is the the canonical example of something that works. Um, they removed it though. Um, <laughs> this is a breaking change for the map filter and slice 
or no, and subarray operators for this polyfill. Uh, but since those are not actually things people use, and we have searched for it, because why would you map U into eight array? Um, <laughs> it, it's not actually encountered a usage that we found. Uh, we are still trying to find. I'm, I'm furious. I, I, I'm furiously writing a case toggle. <laughs> <laughs> the thing that really gets me about this is that um, I value strongly the, the capability, but species never seemed like a good way to deliver it. Yeah, spe this history of species is the small talk collection, sm small talk collection classes uh, did have a species uh, convention and did use it. Uh, and uh, all together with the uh, menagerie of collection classes and how they related to each other, uh, uh, they actually did, I mean, it, it really was useful in that context. Mm -hmm. um, but that was also, I would say, uh, Alan Wersbrock might disagree with this, but I would say uh, the small talk collection classes was the first time anybody really tried to do a deeply object-oriented collection library, uh, and, that was, and therefore, um, it was before we knew how to do it well. Mm -hmm. So this does leak into other proposals. Uh, I know Upsert, Collection Normalization, and a few others uh, have talked about subclassability. Um, this would greatly simplify getting a variety of those proposals together because we don't have to cater to at species. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. The, uh, the, the position of the, of the specification uh, with respect to subclassability has never been sufficiently strong for my taste anyway. Like it, it'll, oh. it has throwaway lines about intended to be subclassed that then the, uh, the actual algorithms in the text don't seem to uh, fall in line with. So this partially solves that because uh, the new story, the new recommendation from the spec is to override any methods you want. Yep. Uh, replaced, which matches a variety of behaviors already in the spec that do not mm -hmm. delegate to add species. Yeah, the simplicity on its own will have value. Cool. I have a short amount of time left, so if we could get to symbols, weak map keys, that would be good. Mm -hmm. So this was actually uh, discussed uh, last time uh, when these guys were here. Uh, from the um, uh, re uh, records and tuples proposal. Uh, the records and tuple proposal uh, has a use case uh, that becomes much easier if we simply allow symbols as weak map keys. Um, and there's a controversy that I started about whether it's symbols as a whole or just unregistered symbols. And I don't know where that's going to land. Um, uh, but uh, unregistered symbol, having at least unregistered symbols be weak map keys is something that uh, I had resisted previously because um, uh, uh, it was a weird case and there was no compelling use case. Uh, records and tuples give us a compelling use case. Uh, the compelling use case is that um, uh, the symbol can be used as a, um, uh, a, a unforgeable token to be looked up in a weak map to designate other mutable things if you have access to that weak map. So there's a bunch of patterns that follow from that where, where you're effectively storing mutable data within a, um, within, sort of within a uh, pure value structure by actually storing these symbols that point through the weak map to the non-pure values. And from a capability perspective, uh, it's perfect because uh, if you don't have access to the side table, then you all you see is the pure values and you can't be referenced. So yes, um, I want to make a quick case that uh, allowing these global 
symbols that are available with uh, forgeability are not problematic, if that's okay. Sure. Um, so we have two points of contention that I see on these. Uh, there may be more, please add them as I talk about this. One is memory leakage. Uh, the ability to forge a symbol means that anything we store in a side table uh, must be kept alive essentially indefinitely uh, until the context in which the forgeability is garbage collected somehow. Um, for some of those, such as symbol.iterator that are uh, shared, uh, that's not possible at all. So we have kind of three categories of symbols. We have the... Uh, for, 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 re for registered symbols, it's as impossible as it is for symbol.iterator. Correct. Uh, yes, sorry. Um, so we, between this, we can already create uh, this kind of memory leak boundary or uh, inability to ever remove something from the side table by using the side table as a key uh, to itself. So that's kind of awkward or using any of the uh, undeniables as keys and then producing a side table within that. No, the, 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 the side table itself is a valid point and I hadn't heard that one before. Uh, the undeniables is not a valid point because uh, realms can be garbage collected. Uh, fair enough. Uh, yes. But we do do the side table trick actually within the polyfill for the old composite key um, uh, proposal. So, I mean, it, it is out there. Um, also, I don't think that memory leakage is really the concern here. I think that's kind of an anti-pattern and we don't need to defend against that specific anti-pattern. Um, you could, uh, for example, have a side table which references something that, uh, well, no, hold on. You could have a record which uses a side table for the non-registered symbols and then has a strong mapping, not a side table, uh, for uh, other things that needs to be passed contextually around. Uh, that is a pattern around it that can allow you to use registered symbols within records and tuples without this concern. Um, it is more difficult to do. In general, I think using registered uh, symbols within these is just an anti-pattern that nobody is really seeking to encourage. Um, people will see that it leaks, they will stop doing it. Um, if they don't, uh, no extra object capabilities are granted by doing so my knowledge. Um, yeah, the, the allowing, uh, allowing registered symbols to be weak math keys um, uh, and just you know, to go extreme here, allowing numbers and strings to be weak math keys uh, uh, you know, creates a permanent leak that doesn't violate any object capability principles. So it's not a object capability concern. Um, it's more of a a concern that when people use a weak map, they're expecting a certain relief from memory pressure. And if once we start allowing things that surprisingly never get collected, uh, then we violate their expectations. So I would yeah. argue that the uh, expectation is based upon the lifetime of whatever the key in the map is not based upon any sort of guarantee that during a garbage collection, it could be collected. Um, so when you put something into a weak map, okay. it is drastically different from arbitrarily adding a private field. You are correct. Private fields are unable to be removed from references ever, even if the private field identifier completely is destroyed currently in the specification. So if there is no way to reference a private field anymore, it will stay alive still. Um, and that I think is a similar concern where you have a way to introduce a permanent leak. Uh, it's not exactly great that you can create a permanent leak, but I don't think it's something we need to prevent people from doing. I think limiting it to symbols is nicer 
than saying arbitrary strings or numbers. Uh, symbols in general are not things that you produce via an operator, uh, like plus or concatenation. They don't, you don't coerce to symbols generally. Um, so they are much less a threat of accidental leakage. Uh, they are a threat yeah. of misusage causing leakage though. I think I'm buying this argument. My key point is we can already create these memory leaks in a variety of ways. And these symbols, although they are forgeable, they are not forgeable through any kind of implicit coercion. Yeah. Uh, this, this point you make about uh, private fields, um, uh, it, the, 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 real, the real problem there was when we added return override to the class mechanism. Um, uh, this uh, thing about uh, removing crap that nobody needs but gets everyone in trouble. Uh, I don't think we could remove return override, but maybe we could restrict it in important ways. I would love that, personally. No, the, that, that does not allow for an inherent permanent memory leak, if, unless I'm quite mistaken. Uh, return override allows you to, um, uh, let's say that, that um, okay. No, no, but so, so what I'm saying is like, um, when, the, when the source of the private field goes out of scope, the private field on the non-instance is itself no longer observable, right? It's no longer, it's no longer observable. Nobody is implementing the private fields in such a way that the storage of the private field goes away. Right, the, understood. But, um, but that yeah. could change over time, like yes, because it, it is not observable. Yes. So unless there is an extreme usage of no, no, I, memory I, leak, they are not going to patch that because- Granted, like, and, I, and I don't expect it to, but the point is that like an engine could still be conforming if it did yeah. so. Um, yeah. I believe so. I am unclear yeah. with regard to finalizers if that is entirely true. What do you mean by finalizers? So if I put some object, so it's now strongly held in a private field um, and it has a weak ref collection finalizer on it. Um, okay. I am not sure that you are actually allowed to collect anything with such uh, final. So the whole the 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 weak the the weak ref semantics um, uh, was a really interesting subtle piece of design uh, to figure out how to have the specification be weak enough that it did not overly constrain implementers, allowed implementers to do things like dead code and dead variable elimination. Uh, uh, structure sharing for closures because of shared lexical context. There's a whole bunch of things that cause um, uh, uh, the actual reachability to differ from any semantic account of reachability in a large number of ways in both directions, both more and less reachability. Um, and this would be this would be an example of that. Um, so we ended up with a um, uh, the kind of subtle spec that people use when they try to specify memory models. And I, th and I think that's actually the right analogy. Um, and it has to do with uh, comparing sort of all the hypothetical executions uh, under cases where something was or was not retained or something. It's, it, it got it got, uh, um, uh, it's well thought out, but um, uh, it's not something I can retain in my head and certainly reason from unless it's fresh. Mm. But that's, that's where I would look to see if the private fields could be garbage collected, even if, um, Weak references make them make the garbage collection observable. 
Uh, yeah, that's the only thing I can think of for the leakage uh, of the identity of something stored within the private field, not the private field itself. Right. Yeah, I'm surprised that built-in modules is not on the agenda anywhere. Uh, I think that was in the incubator call a little while ago, and they are working through issues from that call still. Okay. Um, gentlemen, we are now well past 3 p.m. Yeah. Indeed. I was about to point out, thank you, Alex. Um, I propose that we stop recording. Yep. <laughs>